Sikkim 365 and Baylor Plus have teamed up to bring Baylor fans the ultimate content bundle. You can sign up now for $17.99 a month, a $5 monthly savings, and get instant access to all premium content on both websites. For more information, visit either Sikkim365.com or BaylorPlus.com today. What's up, Baylor family? Welcome to Inside Baylor Sports, the official daily podcast of Baylor Athletics. Cole Barber here with Grayson Grunhafer. It's Tuesday, September 3rd, and we are officially moving forward to week two of Baylor's football season with our first look at the 12th ranked Utah Utes who defeated Southern Utah in week one, 49 to zero. But before we get too in depth there, we want to mention uh, that Coach Dave Miranda had a, a press conference today. These are always very interesting, very telling, even outside of the post game immediate after the games on Saturdays. Talks about injuries, talks about, gives a ton of updates and what's the outlook for the next game. Not as much reflecting on uh, the game that just happened over the weekend. So uh, Grayson, I know that you have a list of things that you took note of from that press conference. Uh, what were your biggest takeaways from what Dave Randa said uh, on Monday um, about what his Bears did and what they're looking forward to uh, against Utah this week? The first big thing that absolutely was just glaring for me, and it should be glaring for anyone who watches Baylor or covers Baylor, um, Richard Reese said after the game that they use about 50 to 60% of their offense is kind of what he guessed as a ballpark estimate. And Dave Randa got asked about that, and he said, yeah, like that's about right. He also alluded to this first game being kind of like the final scrimmage of fall camp kind of yeah. mentioned it in, in that kind of light and how, you know, they were vanilla and, and the inventory of plays and, and all of these different things. That's super important. And, and that leads to a lot of, I think, discussion about, did we really see everything that Jake Spavita and this offense is going to do and wants to do all year long? Mm -hmm. The answer is no. And it's very obvious that that answer is no. How much changes, how much better are they get? How effective are all those plays? Okay, we don't know the answer to that. But what we do know is there is more left on the table. And Aranda was very honest also saying that it's probably the same on the Utah side as well, that there's a lot of gamesmanship going on early in the season before people truly kind of find out who you are at your DNA. Yeah, so Utah, as we mentioned, won 49-0 to over Southern Utah. So you don't expect a ton. Cam Rising's back for his first game since being injured all of last year. Uh, they didn't have to show a lot. I mean, this is a team that would speak to the big, win the Big 12, and I'm really intrigued to see what happens. But I think from the Baylor's perspective, uh, I think it's as we discussed yesterday on Monday, that was kind of what we assumed was the case. I mean, you look, once they got up 28 nothing, it was almost 35 nothing before an interception, but it was just – there was not much of a contest, an opportunity for that game to be competitive, and it allowed Baylor to do the things that they needed to do and work on. And uh, you talk about the the basically running between the tackles. The majority of the game was things they needed to work on, rotating offensive line and trying to figure out what they had there. So I'm with you. I think that it's a, a very telling, and for him to ad address it um, in front of every, everyone was – uh, pretty interesting because I know we know that Dave Miranda is very honest, but he just bluntly said it. So um, I'm really interested because of those comments to see what happens on Saturday with the offense. And kind of piggybacking that com those comments specifically, I felt like Daquan Fenn's, the comments that he made about Daquan Fenn kind of fit in the same category. Cause he said, you know, Daquan did a great job of making throws with pressure in his face, was really happy about that, really happy about the leadership and the attitude. And even with the two turnovers still being very positive, but the thing that he really harped on with Daquan Finn's game was that when there was a clean pocket, they weren't really taking advantage of those opportunities. And you and I, when we looked back at the game, we were kind of like, well, they also just didn't really give him a lot of easy throws. It, it was everything for the most part was deep downfield. Everything was, you know, looking for the big play, looking for the explosive. There weren't a lot of those staples that are in the air raid scheme, like 
the screen game and, you know, that crossing route that is just so prevalent in the air raid scheme. Those two specifically were not used really at all. I think there was like one screen the whole game. So I think that's really important to mention as well, because I do think that will take some pressure off of Fenn from having to look like he's going to try to take a, you know, a home run shot every time he throws the football. Yeah, I believe it was. You mentioned the crossing patterns. I think they attempted like four passes across the middle of the field. One of them was a deep shot. Um, and that's out of – this is for Daquan Finn only, not for Sawyer. I, I didn't look at Sawyer's numbers specifically. But not a lot of stuff over the middle of the field. Uh, they actually uh, – a pass to Michael Trigg was a fake mm -hmm. bubble screen where he – act like he's going to block, release across the middle. And, I mean, it was a great throw and catch for them. But that was one of the few that were a true crossing route over the middle of the field. So they put it on tape. And I think Dave Aranda said it, but uh, I think that you have two coaching staffs that have enough experience offensively and defensively as coordinators, obviously with Dave Aranda as a coordinator now. Um, they're going to attempt to lead each other astray. And, I mean, that's – essentially what i expect i expect both teams to go in a different route from what what they did not in a different route per se but there's gonna be a lot more on the table for both of those coordinators on both sides uh of the team uh the teams I, I would definitely agree so quickly quick hitters here he mentioned michael trigg a lot left in the tank great offensive weapon mentioned him mentioned uh bryson washington and dominic richardson uh seemed like bryson was maybe a little bit further away uh, than Dom, but also said that Dom wasn't cleared yet. He didn't know yet whether he was going to be able to play or not. Uh, that's obviously very relevant as Baylor basically just used Richard Reese and Dawson Pendergrass uh, the whole game this past week. Mm -hmm. uh, those were important. He mentioned Trevin Maye. He mentioned Jackie Marshall as two guys that have really stepped up and played really well uh, in the game, which we knew. Um, but it's nice to see them continuing to take those big steps forward. Those were some of the main comments and topics that he covered all of them pretty important all of them pretty insightful and I, I think it bodes well kind of about the direction that they're heading that he really came away with a lot of positives even though he did mention at the beginning it was far from perfect yeah I mean that was expected if they truly are working on things that maybe they struggle with in fall camp you of course you get into a live game situation you want to work those things even more we've seen that over the years you saw that with matt rule you saw that with dave aranda in 2021 uh in years that end up being very good so not that this season's trending in that direction by any means but there's there's precedent set there for coaching staffs another thing that i will mention too um regarding what dave aranda said that he was asked about play calling and you know the fighter jet comment right like i, I just he's in the grind man he's in the mix and uh, I don't know that there is someone better suited for that type of warfare, for instance, in the, in these games, like he is going to be in the thick of it. So, you know, that this Utah game is as important as game one against Tarleton state was this game on Saturday is something that he has looked ahead to. We, we already know that they looked ahead to air force um, and they worked on the triple option a little bit in fall camp early in fall camp guarantee that this game was on his calendar and circled more than it was Tarleton. So um, I'm as a play caller specifically, not as a head coach, I think as a play caller and a schemer, and you would expect Utah to, to take a similar approach. Um, but I think for different reasons than Baylor did in this particular instance, it's going to be a challenge. Um, but yeah, so anything else in, in regards to his press conference that you wanted to mention? No, just uh, Cam Rising, which we're going to get to here in a sec. Right. Yeah. So as we mentioned, we're going to we're going to dive into what Utah is this year. Baylor fans saw them last year in Waco, um, but a little bit different of a Utah team this year. I mean, a lot of moving pieces with their team. Um, but the biggest part of that is Cam Rising, who had five touchdown passes, which is as many as many incompletions mm -hmm. as he had. So five incompletions, five touchdown passes. One of those passes. Baylor fans will find this interesting is that former Baylor basketball player Caleb Lohner caught one of those. It was late in the game, but he did get one. And, and he's actually been raved about a little bit about their from their coaching staff is with his potential uh, on the on the football field versus the basketball court. Uh, Utah rushed for 185 on 39 carries uh, with one touchdown. A lot of guys got carries, but this was a number to me that stood out a little bit. Um, and uh, but Grayson, I know you have some background on, on Utah and everything that they are as a program. Uh, their coaching staff, everything. I mean, they've they've really been solid under Coach Whittingham for several years. And extremely consistent. I mean, that that's really the staple of this program. I went back to 2018 and just kind of did some research because 
everyone remembers last year's team and let's not forget they had very unfortunate circumstances as their yes. two best offensive players did not play the entire season. They still end up going eight and five and Colt, I found this stat crazy. I remember this, but it's also just one of those kind of, in my eyes, kind of absurd stats was that they were 19th in defense last year. They only gave up 19 points per game. And that was tied to an offense that was number 100 in the nation. That is really hard to do because you're just being hung out to dry a whole lot um, when you're kind of out there. Last year's defense only gave up 83 rushing yards per game. So that was, that's was that been their staple. They do not allow you to run the football. I do believe they are susceptible in the secondary, which we will get to here in a minute. But um, as far as consistency goes, 2022, they had 10 wins. 2021, they had 10 wins. 2019, 11 wins. 2018, 9 wins. They're 32 and three in their last 35 home games as well. So a lot of consistency there. And defensively, they haven't been worse than 35th in the country when it comes to scoring defense. They've been really, really good. And more times than not, they've been a top 15 unit. Yeah. And this is, it's better fans are familiar with TCU making the transition into the Big 12. Utah did that in a similar stage and they went to the Pac 12. And they have been, I would say, more consistent than TCU has been in the Big 12. And you can point to the Pac-12 and everything that happened there, but the Pac-12 was a, still a, a Power 5 conference, and Utah continued their stability uh, with Coach Whittingham. And, I mean, it, it's been impressive, man. Like, I, I don't think there's any way around that. They, they What they have done, uh, I don't know how many Pac-12 championships they end up winning, but they beat USC a numerous times um, to kind of take that title and obviously battle Oregon a ton as well. And, um, and it, it, it is very impressive. And this is their first year in the Big 12, and they're predicted to win the Big 12 this year. Uh, I think a lot will have to go right for them, but they are predicted to win it. And, man, it's better. Fortunately, in a, in a way, they're playing him as an, an out-of-conference game. This is not a conference game, so it doesn't count against their conference record if they were to lose it and vice versa for Baylor. Um, but, yeah, I, I think, uh, man, they have a DNA as a program. They have the stability, and it translates every single – I mean, a lot like Oklahoma State eight and five was their, you know, their down year, right? Like mm -hmm. that's very impressive for a program like this to have an eight and five year. And it is a down year. Right. And they've had their coordinators there forever with Andy Ludwig mm -hmm. as the OC who Dave Randa gave great praise for during the press Good conference. Friends, and I, apparently, yeah, right. I, I actually, I thought Baylor looked at him at one point as well as an offensive coordinator at one time. I could be misremembering that, but they clearly have a good relationship. And then, of course, yeah. uh, Morgan Scally as the defensive coordinator. He's also the coach in waiting there um, yeah. to replace Kyle Whittingham. So it's just a great culture to have those three just being locked into the program for as long as they have been creates a lot of consistency. And that that's really built into their DNA is consistency. And I know people will say oh they haven't won bcs bowls or oh they haven't done this that's fine they've been consistently winning 10 games every single year and i think most programs would absolutely love that kind of stability yeah no doubt so let's get let's get through their roster so that what this team is for them this year uh baylor fans saw them last year a game that baylor fans will say absolutely should have won that game just gave it away at the end looking back uh, it kind of foreshadowed the rest of the season and the struggles that Baylor would have. Obviously, before that, they lost to Texas State, but that game was if they won that game, maybe the season goes completely different route. Um, obviously, they're closer to bowl eligibility, but uh, it, it could have been a confidence booster for that entire team. So the key factor here is Cam Rising's back. They have stability at quarterback, and Dave Aranda actually mentioned Cam Rising today specifically when asked and what he brought. And we have a clip for you to listen to really quick about what he said about Cam Rising. I think he's equipped uh, to go from a pass to a run. He's equipped to go from run here to run there. Um, I think he knows, um, you know, rotation. He knows uh, blitz tells. He knows front and how that's tied to the back end. If the front will tip off what the back end's going to be. And so just way smart. Uh, he is the captain of that ship. And so he gets them in the right spots, I guess, would be the, the best way to say it. But then, you know, I think running ability is still a factor. And I think his arm strength and his touch is really strong, too. 
Yeah, so Grayson, I think everyone points to that knee injury that he had. And I think that at this stage of his career, he's had multiple ACL injuries. Um, it's going to impact him. I know Dave Aranda mentioned that it's still going to be a factor. It's still going to be a factor. Kyle Whittingham mentioned that they had to be careful in the way that they use him. But I think when you get into close games, that kind of goes out the window. But what Cam Rising brings is exactly what Dave Aranda said. It's getting them into the best place possible. We've heard that discuss about Baylor's quarterbacks. Which plays can you get into based on what your quarterback sees and can um, audible into whatever he needs to do? Cam Rising's going to do that. And if you look at their game against Southern Utah, I don't know the exact game plan of that, but they threw for a lot of yards and didn't rush for as many as you would expect in that game. Absolutely. And they really allowed Cam Rising to kind of get a feel for things and have really easy opportunities. I mean, Andy Ludwig, I, I mentioned on our boards during the game. I mean, he was just in his bag. I mean, the, these guys were running wide open yeah. down the field and you're just like, holy cow, Cam is just kind of just throwing it out there for him, just laying it out there for him to go score a touchdown. So he was really effective. I didn't feel like there were a ton of wow throws. There were probably two that I was like, okay, that looks like the Cam rising that I remember before he got hurt. Um, He didn't run for much, obviously in that game there you are, they were definitely not going to try to run him. Yeah. Uh, but in general, he's a guy that for the last two years before he got hurt, basically 500 yards and six touchdowns on the ground. More of a physical runner, a first yeah. down kind runner, like on third down. And, you know, when you're in fourth and one, utilizing that from him, that's more what he was. Not really this, you know, elusive, you know, juke you out of your shoes kind of guy. He's looking to run through contact and get first downs. He's got a big, uh, thick frame. As far as a passer goes, not a huge arm, but very accurate. Basically a 65% completion percentage guy, and he doesn't turn the football over either. Uh, he only has 13 interceptions in the last two seasons that he played. Mix that with 46 passing touchdowns. Kind of tells you the, the story there uh, between his ratio. So he's a very good quarterback. He's going to be a problem, and he's going to challenge Baylor's secondary much more than they were challenged in week one. Um which can either be a good thing or or a bad thing. We're going to find out because we didn't learn enough from Baylor's secondary in that first game to really tell how much they've improved. Yeah, so Cam Rising in a lot of ways, if you watch him play, reminds me a ton of Gary Bohannon running the football. And I think in a very similar way of he's going to go, it's fourth and one, and he's gonna he can, has the ability to get to the corner and get the fourth and one, or he can QB sneak it. If it's third and seven, um, and you don't don't account for him, he's going to go and get a first down. Um, but he's not going to blow – he's not Daquan Finn. He's not going to go and no. just break off for 35 yards and uh, – sorry, 40, 50 yards. I think he can do a 35-yard run. I don't think he's going to go 40, 50 yards and chasing him downfield in any instance, especially now with his knee injury. So I'm uh, – but he is a gamer, man. Like, there's no doubt in my mind that if this game comes down to it and it's a close game, that he will make go and make plays. Um, he's – you don't you can't strip any type of quarterback like he is from being able to do that. Absolutely. The one difference I would say between him and Gary running styles wise are he has a much better feel for oh, sure. when to take Absolutely. off and run. You know what I mean? Just that mm -hmm. that kind of, you know, that Baker Mayfield type. OK, I'm just taking off and I don't I'm not even going to look downfield now. I need to get this first down. That's mm -hmm. kind of what Cam does. It's kind of that old school football mentality, which really works a lot you know, especially in college football. So I'm very curious to see if he still has that. I think he's going to get tested by Baylor's defensive line and pass rush a little bit, and they're going to try to test him and his mobility, I, I think, a lot in this game, actually. I think they're going to make him prove it uh, as far as running goes, probably more so than allowing him to just stand in the pocket and make throws. Yeah, so his favorite targets right now, and I think really throughout his career, have been the tight ends. Um, and in that first game, I think – all were all five of his touchdown passes to tight ends, or was it just four of them? Maybe just four of them with Caleb Lohner and then three to Keithy, and he, then no. One so more. I think Keithy Keithy had three of them, and then Dijon Stanley had the the other two from Rising, and then the backup threw the one Got to it. Lohner. Okay, yeah. yeah. So they're they're tech, they're they're throwing it to the tight ends, and that's been a staple of that offense. It's very similar to what Baylor utilized under Jeff Grimes, throwing it to a lot of tight ends. Um, and they have athletic guys. So uh, what's your overview of that tight end room? Obviously, Keithy is another guy coming back from injury that Baylor didn't see last year, but he just catches touchdowns. Brant Keithy is probably the biggest X factor in this game. I, I think he's going to give Baylor a whole lot of problems. And it was an area that Baylor, it's really an area Baylor has struggled with a lot. 
for a while, I feel like tight ends, you know, when they've played Iowa State, it felt like the, those tight ends were getting loose often. We saw Jared Wiley last year for TCU just go crazy. Um, Keithy has that ability. Uh, as a sophomore, he had 600 yards and seven touchdowns. He only played in four games in 2022, and then he missed all of last year. Um, but kind of sneaky uh, for him. He's got four rushing touchdowns in his career, which I found really interesting. I was like, whoa, four rushing touchdowns. So they might try to hand the ball off to him on a reverse or something along those lines and uh, try to get him going. But like I said, two seasons of 600 yards and seven touchdowns really kind of tells you the story of what he's going to bring to the table. He had three touchdowns in their first game. They're going to target him heavily. I think he's a future NFL tight end. So he is going to be definitely a focal point, I think, for Baylor's defense. Yeah, Utah has churned out uh, tons of tight ends in terms of production year after year. Um, and, and truly, I could just, if you look at what Baylor did defensively and what they added in the offseason, I think a lot of focus was on stopping guys like this. And, and you do see a lot of spread offenses, but you mentioned it. The, these types of tight ends just give Baylor fits. I mean, and truly, I think the college game has gotten away from tight ends so much that any tight end is an issue because most teams aren't equipped to do it. Um, but I, I'm really intrigued to see uh, Baylor's star position in these circumstances. I think uh, Carl Williams and Kendrick Simpkins are, are suited well. Um, it would be a, a very intriguing matchup, but also a guy like Keaton Thomas running out there. Keaton's athletic enough. Um, Raw Raw Dilworth, uh, I don't know what the plans for him, but Baylor has a few guys that they didn't have last year. This is an uh, entirely different group of fast second level, not safeties, uh, per se, they can play more of a cornerback or a linebacker position at the star. If you're not familiar with it, they play really all over the field. Um, and then their linebackers have gotten more athletic. So uh, definitely an interesting matchup to watch there. Um, looking at Baylor, uh, Utah's offensive line, I would say probably the the least experienced group um, based on, on pro football focus and the snaps that they have played. Um, but that doesn't mean they're not talented. It just means that they're, they're more or less experienced than the rest of their team. And Interestingly, I feel like it might have shown up in the first game because you in a game that you would expect them to run for 300 yards, they rushed for 185, which I haven't sat down and watched the game film, but uh, that's not typical for a Utah team to only rush for 185 yards in a game like this. It's not, and I was not very impressed with their offensive line when it came to run blocking. I was a little bit kind of surprised, I would say, by not not their inability, but just how they were – kind of just not doing what typical Utah teams do Utah where they're just yeah. grinding out drives. They're running the football. They're getting yardage, you know, very often. Yeah, you're right. They gave it to a bunch of different running backs and they all were fine, but it wasn't anything, you know, really that jumped off the page to me as far as their running game goes. I know Micah Bernard was their is their projected starter. He's probably going to be their workhorse running back. Uh, probably important to mention they lost Jaquindon Jackson from last Arkansas. year's team, who's now at Arkansas running wild uh, for the Hogs. So yeah. um, Bernard's going to be the guy there. Uh, Dijon Stanley, who we're going to mention here in a second with the receivers, uh, he's also a running back. And so he's kind of used in a bunch of different ways. He's actually kind of their actual guy with a ton of athleticism they don't have a lot of guys like him but he's got a ton of speed a ton of make you miss ability really very different than the other guys that they have but it's all going to be set up around their offensive line the the offense line has to be able to protect cam rising allow him to sit in the pocket dissect defenses and make throws and hopefully him not having to run all over the place i don't think utah wants that in this game um, but we'll see they're going to get challenged. I know they got two second year guys playing both tackle positions and Caleb Lomu and Spencer Fano, I believe. Yeah. And so two young guys, they're very talented. They were both highly rated, highly ranked recruits, um, but still they're young still. And so yeah. we'll see how they respond and see how, you know, Baylor's edge rushers, if they can take advantage of that. Yeah, uh, Baylor's, I, I would say after week one, it's kind of a matchup of strengths versus weaknesses in defensive line for Baylor, offensive line for for Utah. I, I really am intrigued to see Coach Aranda's quote, if it comes to play here, of was Utah just attempting to lead Baylor astray in what they're able to do with running the football because they went completely opposite of what you would uh, anticipate a Utah team doing. So um, I think that's the question mark for Utah. Defensively, we're about to talk – or sorry, receivers. I know you wanted to mention receivers and, and what those playmakers that they have outside of the tight ends are able to do. So I'm going to hand, hand that to you and let you discuss 
um, that receiver specifically that you wanted to, to talk about? So I mentioned Dijon Stanley. He had six carries for 34 yards. He also had three catches for 150 yards and two touchdowns. It was basically two wheel routes that really got that production. So from the running back position, but he also lined up in the slot and got some carries from the slot and jet sweep type situation. So I'm curious how they use him again. He's kind of the guy that really scares me the most. Like when I watch the film, I'm like, Oh, if you miss a tackle, he's going to make you pay. He's got that kind of athleticism outside of that. It's a bunch of kind of, I guess, proven commodities that maybe aren't so proven anymore, uh, especially when you look at Dorian Singer. Uh, as a yep. sophomore at Arizona, he had 1,100 yards and six touchdowns. Then he had a terrible year at USC last year with just 289 yards receiving. And so they're hoping that he can kind of be the alpha and really live up to what he did at Arizona. I think that's still to be determined. And then two other guys, Money Parks, kind of a safety net option uh, in their mm-hmm. passing game. And then Dadrian Zipper, a young guy, but a good athlete and a guy who I think will be really good eventually. I just don't know if he is at that level quite yet. Yeah, very, very. If you've watched Baylor play enough over the last few years, Utah offensively is built very similar. They're going to have a couple guys at receiver that can go and make plays heavy in the tight end room, want really good running backs, really good offensive line play. Um, it just built different than a lot of teams in college football, specifically in the Big 12 are these days. Uh, Kansas kind of trended that way. Um, looking at the defensive side of the ball, man, like I don't know that you can just say, oh, this is the reason they're good defensively for all these years. They just play good, sound defense. Coach Scali's done a great job with that entire program defensively. There's a reason he's a coach in waiting. But, man, like I don't think that you can isolate and say, this is why, this is why, this is why they're good. Just – it's just a program and it's just a system that they're able to, to every single year have returns from what they put on the field. I don't know. I mean, truly like, and this is just me kind of being a casual passive observer of Utah. Like, I don't know. There's a guy that I just remember being a, a, an all out stud, but they're just consistent constantly. They absolutely are. And they're very disciplined and, and that's, that's been a staple for them for a long time. It's kind of like Iowa state. Honestly, Iowa State's had some really good defenses and it's been very consistent as well. It's kind of similar to that. We're, I mean, yes, they have dudes every once in a while, but it's also like just a culture of just everyone playing together. And, and I think that allows them to overcome injuries, allows them to overcome, you know, if one guy's not playing well, they're able to kind of, I think, fix that on the fly. I was very impressed by what they did against Southern Utah. I felt like they really dominated the point of contact up front. Uh, the line of scrimmage was not moving against these guys and then beyond that they had five sacks but then they also had 12 quarterback hurries in this game eight tackles for loss it's a scary unit i mean it's a unit that has experience it's a unit that has a bunch of different kind of athletes and different body types that i think pair really well it allows them to stop the run but also get after the quarterback um connor o'toole is a name that i'm sure some baylor fans remember Uh, he's one of their best pass rushers he's a really good player a junior tafuna kind of up in the middle Uh, he's another really good prospect for them um they're just solid and they got guys that have played a lot of football And, and then when you watch them it's like wow they really know what they're doing. They're coached extremely well. Baylor's going to have to be kind of ready to go for that because I do think Utah is going to be able to create some pressure that Tarleton wasn't going to be able to create, and I'm curious how Baylor responds to that. Yeah, I think game game planning comes in here incredibly much. Like It's just like they're not going to be able to, to go in with a similar game plan to what they did against Tarleton. Refer back to that, that Dave Aranda quote. There is no reason that Baylor should have had to show more than what they did in that game. Uh, but earlier you did mention, and I'm I'm on board with you, that there might be a hole in that defense uh, for Utah. And I, I'm you didn't mention what it was, but I'm curious if it, we were going down the same path. So what was the hole that you see for Baylor to take advantage of on Utah's defense, which is obviously very solid? It's absolutely the secondary. I mean, that's the area that I think Baylor is going to have to have a lot of success. And this is really, I think a lot of this is going to come down to all the additions that Baylor made this off season on the offensive side of the ball, the new scheme, the ability to take one-on-one shots with their skilled guys. Now, can these receivers win one-on-one battles and Daquan, can Daquan Finn get enough time 
to actually allow these guys to to potentially make plays downfield. I think if they're able to do that, I, I do see a, a scenario where Baylor's able to throw for a lot of yards in this game, able to move the ball consistently, get first downs, and really just win one-on-one matchups in the secondary. Uh, Utah's going to give you some cushions at times. They're going to press you at times too, but they'll give you cushion, allow you to get yards. And then when you get in the red zone, you're going to have to really um, buckle down and, and make plays. And so I think the big thing for me is I, I do believe Baylor's going to have to hit on some explosives in this game, some big explosives down the field if they want a chance to win it. I don't think they're going to be able to have 12 play drives consistently. Right. So they're going to yeah, have so, to be able to capitalize. Yeah. So so a key there is that Utah actually just lost their, uh, I would say, their best corner, their most anticipated corner. They did lose a guy to the transfer portal to TCU. But Keenan Johnson is out for the season. He got hurt in that first game. They had a couple injuries on that side of the ball, but this was the big one. Um, and, and not that, you know, one guy can make or break a defense. That's not the case. We've seen it all the time. Like, you go into games, you expect, oh, they, you know, so-and-so is out for – this opponent and how can this be taken advantage of but in a situation where Baylor needs every advantage that they can to take take advantage of uh, a game on the road um, a, a, a tough place to play having a cornerback out that is potentially their best I mean you, you imagine Caden Jenkins or whoever you want to label as Baylor's best defensive player being out Baylor fans immediately begin to worry about that that problem I think Utah is deep enough that um, they could overcome it but when Baylor wants to go five wide or they want to go four wide with a tight end, there's going to be a hole that's exposed more greatly, not at the number one spot in my mind, but down the chain of who's going to match up with Michael Trigg in the slot, who's going to do this or that. And so having a, a starting corner out in this particular game, it's one week after the injury occurred, what does the next man up look like and how does that chain affect chain um kind of effect down and you look down to the slots you look down to the third and fourth receivers so it's going to be an intriguing um, thing to watch how Utah handles that um, because uh, you know you mentioned as a, as a weakness or a potential hole their depth obviously uh, I can't remember the guy that transferred to TCU's name right now but that's two essentially two really good corners that they lost and um, maybe that's the hole that better can expose yeah, it absolutely could be, and I, I think it has to be, honestly, if they're going to win this game. I, I think Daquan Finn's going to have to be able to take advantage of things in the secondary. Uh, you're right, losing a guy like Keenan Johnson is a big deal. I mean, they were going to roll out, I believe it was three seniors, with one of them being, I think, like a six-year guy and a junior and then a sophomore. But now in the secondary, they're rolling out two sophomores now that you might be able to target. Uh, one of their older senior guys is a transfer, so kind of to be determined there, I would say, on you know how effective that's going to be. But I think in general, it gives them another potential hole to, to attack. Yeah. May, maybe if you have a weak link there at your cornerback position, uh, Ketron Jackson's able to make a you know, one or two more explosive plays down the sideline. You know, maybe you're able to kind of attack things in that way or look at it in that way. Um, but I do think in general, it adds a little more nuance to this matchup and, and a little more intrigue into, hey, how does Baylor exploit that? How does Jake Spavita attack that? You know, do they go to the screen game and force a sophomore to be far more physical than maybe he has been in the past instead of being like, oh, I'm having to run a screenplay at a senior that's seen this a million times before. Um, you just never know. I think those little nuances are going to be very important in this game. Yeah, no, there's no doubt about it. And, and after last year, I think Utah in a lot of ways is not built to expose and – or excuse me, explode on teams and pull away from teams. They do it, uh, but it's not necessarily how they are built. So if Baylor's able to move the ball with consistency um, on offense – I do think their defense is going to put them in positions to win this game. I, I think that's what it comes down to. If Baylor can move the ball enough against a solid Utah defense, I think that that Baylor's defense will make enough plays to keep this close. It's a 17 point spread right now, or 15. I think it's down to 15. That's a lot yeah. of points, and uh, especially after a game last year that uh, obviously a lot of backup quarterbacks in that game. But it, I don't know, man. Like it, that just seems like a lot of points to me at the end of the day. And uh, I think that Coach Rand is going to have this team ready to play. So any final thoughts on Utah and what this matchup looks like? 
I think it's going to be a really fun one. I know we're going to give our predictions on Friday for kind of how we see the game playing out. But I think in general, this is a very intriguing matchup. We knew it was going to be. We knew both these teams were going to circle this game uh, just because it was their first true test. Um, and Baylor's going to have to match a level of physicality that uh, I don't feel like they've matched consistently enough. And so it's really going to be one of those moments where, okay, that culture that you established in the offseason, are there holes in it? We're going to find yeah. out, I think, really quickly against Utah on Saturday. All right, Baylor family, that's going to do it for today's episode of Inside Baylor Sports, uh, the official daily podcast of Baylor Athletics. Thank you, Baylor fans, for listening, and any Utah fans who also tuned into this one. Uh, for Grayson Grunhafer, I'm Colt Barber. Have a great Tuesday, and sick and bears.